All right. I think it's time to kick off. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone that is dialing in. Um, I'm on the West Coast, so I'm going to say good morning and good morning to all of my co-hosts. Um, today's session is on Rook as storage for Kubernetes clusters. Uh, this is not something that's going to be specific to, to Platform 9 and our, our managed Kubernetes solution. This is something that's just general knowledge and helpful for, for running clusters anywhere. And we're going to get into Rook, how it works, its architecture, a bit of how to deploy it, and some, I guess, tips and tricks around getting it up and running on a, a smaller size cluster. Um, there are some, some, some nuances to it if you just want to sort of get storage on a cluster and learn. So hopefully we'll cover that. And I'm going to get a nook to, to share his screen, see him, he's the, uh, the main presenter today, and we'll uh, get started from there. Yeah, hi Chris, uh, good morning. I'll just share my screen. Excellent. Before we, uh, before we jump in, let's do a quick round of introductions. Um, if you regularly join these, Chris Jones, Group Product Manager here at Platform Now, I look after our Kubernetes stack. With me on the phone today, or on Zoom, I guess, is Anup, one of our Kubernetes engineers, works in our, our growth team, so actually covers quite a lot of uh, different pieces here at Platform 9, including getting applications up and running on, on Kubernetes. And right now, we're doing a, a bunch of work around Rook and Ceph to try to make it super easy for everyone to consume and deploy uh, on any clusters they build. And as always with our Ask Us Anything sessions or the fortnights, we run these for you guys, our attendees. So if you have questions, please either shoot a question off in chat, use the Q&A if we have it open, jump into our Slack. Um, we have an AMA channel where we, we look for questions during these sessions. Or if you're feeling brave and want to have a conversation, raise your hand and we will unmute you. If we do do that, just ask for, try to limit to one question, just so we give everyone time to ask questions and and learn together. So with that, um, I'm gonna hand over to Anup to jump into to Rook, Ceph, storage, and let's go from there. Okay, uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome to this talk on Rook Operator. I'll start uh, with some very basic concepts around storage and Kubernetes, and we'll use them to build more details around Rook. By the way, this logo on screen is taken from Rook's official website, Critical, I think. With that, let's start. So ultimately, uh, what is a one-liner problem statement in storage context? Simple store application data for an application that is running on a Kubernetes cluster onto some persistent storage. Although this seems pretty simple, there are lots of complexities involved in achieving this. Let's see how. So uh, to elaborate a bit more in Kubernetes context, let us take an example where there are a couple of nodes in a Kubernetes cluster. In, and each node is running a couple of application pods. Now these applications running on different pods need to access persistent storage. One simple architecture is to have the application access the storage that is on the local nodes. Obviously this persistent storage is not that persistent, right? So if the node crashes, uh, everything is lost. So you need to change the architecture a bit and this is how uh, obvious changes uh, to make the storage remote. This achieved the following. So it basically uh, uh, survives cluster crashes, is available to all nodes and internally to all pods as well in the cluster if we find out a way to access it remotely. And of course, uh, if we get new replicas of pods or if pods get destroyed and get newly created, it is available to all the new instance of the pods. So let's zoom in into this remote persistent storage box that is represented at the pod. 
I found this nice little diagram on uh, Ubuntu's website, uh, which explains different storage types, depending on the properties of application, different storage, uh, uh, different solutions um, are available. Um, and mainly uh, there are three types of storage. One is block, other is file, and the third is object storage. So the block storage in middle provides network access to the equivalent of raw block devices. So a, a client machine connects to a specific volume on the storage service and basically formats it uh, as if it were a local block device. So typically uh, block devices are exported over fiber channel or ISPC protocols. So um, block storage chops the data uh, into blocks and stores them as separate pieces. So each block of data is given a unique block identifier. So that's how a typical block storage is used uh, in, as an underlying layer for large databases, for example. On the, on the other hand, uh, on the left is the file storage. And uh, it is a single piece of information in a probably a big folder to help uh, organize it among, uh, uh, organize among the other data. So uh, this is also called a hierarchical storage. And uh, when you need to access uh, data, uh, your operating system needs to know the path to find it. So multiple clients can access a single uh, directory, uh, which is shared uh, using the shared file system uh, and the protocols like NFS and uh, SMB or SIFS come into picture. So there are a number of file systems that are in production today, like for example, Luster uh, in HPC domain, uh, 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 where multiple applications run on uh, uh, a luster, which is kind of a, a very popular one. Uh, there are ext variants, butterfs in Linux, etc. On the right uh, is the object storage. It is designed for unstructured data, such as media, documents, logs. And uh, conceptually, they are like a persistent key value store. So objects are usually submitted via REST API calls and, and Identifier is returned and table example of this is AWS S3. So we also hear a lot about the keyword volume. Um, and for now, let's just call it as a logical entity around uh, on top of a storage device. Uh, each of these are separate monster topics for tech talk. So this was yeah. just an introduction. Yeah. I was gonna say in the uh Object storage, if, if people are looking at that and sort of thinking, ah, oh, S3, that's cool. How do I get that into a cluster? Um, Mini IO is a great solution for that as well. So you could you could put down Ceph or any other type of block storage and then and then provision that to to be the back end for a, a mini IO deployment. We could cover that in a, a future topic as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so moving on. Um, Back to Kubernetes and storage, uh, let's just quickly take a look at a uh, few definitions. Um, so how does uh, native Kubernetes handle storage? Uh, Kubernetes natively offers some solutions to manage storage. So ephemeral options, persistent storage in terms of persistent volumes, persistent volume claims, storage classes, or stateful sets. And uh, uh, this seems to be uh, a something that we should note at, and uh, we should also look into at least some basics of what it is. So uh, persistent volumes are storage units that have been provisioned by an administrator, for example. And they are independent of any pod um, and uh, uh, they break free from uh, ephemeral uh, life cycle of pods. So uh, persistent volume claims uh, on the other hand, are requests for the storage that is uh, persistent volumes. Uh, with persistent volume claim, it is possible to bind storage to a particular node, making it available to the node for usage. So there are two ways of dealing with this storage. Uh, one is static, other is dynamic. For, with static provisioning, uh, the administrator provisions persistent volumes, and uh, these persistent volumes are manually bound to uh, specific parts with explicit persistent volume claims. So um, this is not a scalable option. Uh, it needs uh, 
it, it also probably goes against the mindset of Kubernetes in terms of how de developers think about resources. So uh, in terms dynamic provisioning, it is done with storage classes. Cluster administrator does not need to manually create uh, the persistent volumes beforehand. And uh, uh, basically they instead create uh, multiple profiles of storage, just like templates. And when developer makes a persistent volume claim, uh, depending on the requirements of the request, one of these templates is created at the time of request and attached to the form, right? So few more concepts, quick, quick introduction to them. Uh, container storage interface, uh, which will come up every now and then. So a basic introduction to it. It was developed as a standard for exposing arbitrary uh, block and file storage uh, systems to containerized workloads. Uh, and uh, by using CSI, the Kubernetes volume layer becomes uh, kind of a truly extensive. It is uh, third part. So uh, multiple third party storage providers can ha have created uh, CSIs uh, for their systems. Yeah, I, know, uh, I think this is a, a good point to, to touch on this while we're on the CSI interface. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. If people are running in, in cloud and they're using, say, AWS, Azure, or Google, um, there you're likely using, if you've been doing this for a while, you're likely actually using what was called the entry storage drivers. They're, they're technically not a, a CSI driver. Um, what happened is the, the Kubernetes project um, decided upstream that storage shouldn't be something that's inside of Kubernetes itself because that was actually impeding the storage vendors from delivering um, new features or fixing patches like, or fixing bugs in, in real time. So the CSI interface was developed to externalize the storage and provide a common set of, of interfaces, including um, features like snapshots and stuff like that that can be implemented by each storage vendor. This is important if you're in AWS or Azure or Google right now, because there is or there are new CSI drivers that have been developed and as of 122, that's going to be the way to access storage in those clouds as well. So this is the, the future of storage for Kubernetes, one could say. Um, and it allows a much more dynamic uh, development cycle for container storage. And it allows all those external vendors to say, oops, there's a bug. I can patch it and I can do it outside of um, the, the Kubernetes release cycle as well. So CSI is... A really important aspect. Um, it is how storage should be being provided into your your clusters today. It's the the future. And if you are in cloud and you're running, you know, any of the EKSs, AKSs, or GKEs, or even maybe say COPS, um, when it comes to time to move to Kubernetes 1.22, do pay attention to how your storage is being provisioned. Um, and if you're using a storage class that's going directly to one of those cloud storage solutions, um, I would definitely say, look up the migration path prior to upgrading. Yeah, very true. Sorry to, sorry to interject. I just thought no, we're talking uh, on CSI drivers. Yeah, this is uh, pretty useful information, Chris. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, there is also an upcoming concept called COSI, which is a container object storage interface. And uh, this is specifically aimed uh, towards standardizing the object storage uh, interfacing with the Kubernetes. Vendors can then write their own COSI drivers to enable applications to use their object storage system. Um, so this essentially aims at being a common layer of abstraction uh, across multiple object storage, storage vendors. So such as uh, workloads can then request and automatically be provisioned uh, across object storage buckets. So uh, just keep in mind that this COSI is different from common operating system interface that was recently introduced at KubeCon, uh, which is different and aims at API-driven operating systems. So that's different. Uh, another concept, uh, operators. Uh, we are going to talk about Rook operator. So a bit about uh, operators. So uh, applications can be stateless or stateful. Kubernetes has traditionally been stateless. So uh, a Kubernetes operator is an uh, application specific controller 
uh, that extends functionality of the Kubernetes API to create, configure, uh, and manage instances of uh, applications on behalf of Kubernetes users. So uh, it builds upon basic Kubernetes resource and uh, controller concepts, but uh, also kind of includes um, the application specific knowledge to automate the entire life cycle of uh, the software it manages. So uh, two things, one is uh, the control loop and uh, things are domain specific. So uh, in Kubernetes controllers of uh, the control plane implement uh, control loops um, that repeatedly compare the desired state to the uh, actual state of the cluster. Uh, so if the cluster's actual state doesn't match the desired state, then the controller takes uh, some action uh, to fix the problem. Right, so that's a bit about operators. Now, what needs to be managed? So after looking at some basic concepts, uh, it's time to see some challenges uh, in terms of managing these storage systems in context of Kubernetes. So uh, typically there are three layers that need attention. First, uh, the data layer in storage. This typically is the actual file system, say ext4. So this layer is managing the data on the disk. It has its own internal architecture and data management layers. So uh, it has also its own disk uh, on disk layouts, in memory layouts, so on and so forth. The second layer is the CSI layer, uh, which is responsible for provisioning and mounting the storage into Kubernetes pods. So typically the vendors or open source community implement this layer. And the third layer is the actual management of storage. For example, day one operations like deployments, day two operations like upgrades, monitoring, maintaining the reliability of these storage systems, et cetera. So um, Rook uh, in, in our case is going to take care of the second and third layers that I described, uh, typically for Ceph, but also for other, uh, some other storage providers. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll look into those. Uh, so what is Rook? Uh, we probably now have enough background information to go into details of Rook. So it is a open source cloud native storage orchestrator. So it provides platform framework and support uh, for a set of storage solutions. And it turns storage management software into self-managing, self-scaling and self-feeling services. So what does that mean? We'll, we'll look into that. So before that, some basics. Uh, this is a graduated CNCF project uh, and it graduated in October, 2020. Uh, it works with Apache 2.0 license, written in Golang. Uh, the, the latest version uh, which I saw was uh, 1.7 and lots of contributors and lots of comments. So, uh, we said that Rook turns software into self-managing, uh, self-scaling, and self-healing storage services. So it does this by automating deployment, uh, bootstrap, bootstrapping, uh, configuration, provisioning, scaling, upgrading, migration, disaster recovery, monitoring, and resource management. So lots of stuff it's doing. Uh, it uses the facilities provided by the underlying cloud native container management, uh, scheduling and orchestration platform uh, to kind of get these capabilities going. So uh, the Rook operator that is basically is its control loop, uh, which takes care of defining the desired states uh, of all these capabilities and tries to converge the current state of these capabilities uh, to desired state. So uh, this is a snapshot from their GitHub repo. Uh, can manage Ceph, Cassandra, and NFS. Ceph is something which has which it had started with, and it is used in many production deployments today. It is pretty stable, but others are in alpha stage. So I, I'll try to focus more on Ceph going forward. Cassandra is something that I can briefly talk about, not in much detail, probably at the end. And also about NFS, uh, there is uh, very little information on its state on the web. So maybe just a slide uh, on it going further. So uh, should we kind of wait and see if there are any questions, Chris? Uh, 
I cannot see any questions uh, in the chat. <laughs> I was on mute. <laughs> I was talking and you could not hear me. My apologies. Ah. Yeah, there are no questions have come in so far. Hopefully this has set a good sort of baseline for people um, between storage, Rook, and, and now now Seth as a as a block as a block driver. Um, Seth is also an open source distributed storage system that's been around for a very long time, um, common in the, the world of OpenStack. Um, it can also be run just as a as a way to take common x86 hardware and turn it into a, a distributed storage array. Um, it can also be set up in a, a hyper-converged mode as well, which is, I think, probably the most common way of doing it right now within the, the world of, of Kubernetes. Um, it's pretty cool. It'll automatically replicate data between all of the, the Ceph nodes and provide that, that resiliency there. And instead of having to build it and run it yourself, Rook can come in over the top and orchestrate all of the, the Ceph components and just provide storage in a super quick, easy way. Yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll dive uh, more de uh, in detail uh, around what Ceph is and how its architecture look like, looks like. Uh, so uh, before that, maybe what we can do is just quickly take a uh, look at the Rook architecture. I have taken this diagram from Rook's official website. Uh, there will be some forward referencing around what I'm going to talk about, but uh, yeah, just bear with me. So uh, as uh, you can see in the image, uh, it uses Kubernetes primitives to run on Kubernetes. So typically Rook uses CRDs, which are custom resource definitions to create and customize storage clusters. And these uh, CRDs are implemented uh, to, uh, uh, in Kubernetes during its deployment process. So. Uh, uh, also, uh, it has an operator within Kubernetes named Rook operator for Ceph, which uh, automates configuration of storage components and monitors the cluster uh, to ensure that storage uh, probably remains uh, available and um, healthy. So it also looks at fault tolerance. So um, Rook uh, also runs a daemon set which is called Rook Discover. And they start discovery agent on every node um, of your Kubernetes cluster. And this discovery, uh, discovery takes place uh, where it looks for raw disk devices, uh, where there are no partitions or formatted file systems or uh, raw partitions uh, that can be used by Ceph, OST disk, I, I'll talk about what it is. Uh, if a minimum number of disks uh, are discovered, Rook operator will go ahead and use those disks to build a Ceph cluster. So if you add more disks to your nodes, the operator discovers them via these agents and it will scale the Ceph cluster automatically. Of course, there are uh, knobs uh, in the operator uh, configuration where you can disable that, but uh, it does provide this capability. So Rook will also configure the Ceph CSI drivers to provide block storage and shared file system uh, mount support for pods. Uh, it will also cover monitoring requirements uh, and it also provides enabling the Ceph dashboard and uh, each Rook Ceph cluster then will have uh, some built-in matrix uh, that can be scraped by Prometheus. So yeah, as I said, uh, this was a bit of forward referencing in terms of Ceph terminology here, but uh, we'll revisit this flow in a bit more detail after looking at the basics of Ceph. So for now, maybe just treat this as an introduction to the architecture. So, uh, we will have to do a bit of context switch here to understand what exactly it is uh, that Rook is managing. So what is Ceph? Uh, it is a distributed storage system that is massively scalable and high performing with no single point of failure. So this is the definition that they um, provide on their website. And 
uh, it is a software distributed system, uh, meaning it can run on any hardware that matches its requirements. So this diagram that I have taken is from one of the Ceph videos available, uh, shows various modules of Ceph. So here, the layer in red is the actual brain behind the Ceph. It is called RADOS, a reliable distributed object store. Uh, so RADOS are at the core of um, Ceph storage clusters. So this layer, make sure that stored data always remains consistent and performs data replication and fault tolerance. So fault tolerance includes uh, replication, failure detection and uh, recovery. So on top of uh, RADOS, there is a, they have a kind of built RADOS gateway, uh, which is a layer representing object storage uh, and it is compatible with S3 and Swift object storage APS. Uh, RBD, a RADOS block device, is a software that facilitates the storage of block-based data. Uh, we also have a Ceph file system, uh, which is POS6 compliant distributed file system uh, that also supports Fuse in uh, that is file system in user space. So uh, all these three included, there is also a library directly interacting with RADOS called libRADOS. It uses uh, socket-based native protocol uh, to talk to RADOS and uh, it can be used by different applications to talk to RADOS. So uh, yeah, uh, one more thing, um, Ceph is strongly consistent. It means that uh, the IO is only declared as complete when uh, it is sent to all its corresponding replicas. Ceph daemons, another diagram credit to be given to the Ceph documentation. Uh, Ceph consists of multiple components in form of daemons. So Ceph monitors are responsible for forming cluster quorums, which are called MON, MONS. Uh, all the cluster nodes uh, basically report to monitor nodes and share information about uh, the change in the state. So they are typically small in number and odd in number. Uh, so they do not serve the stored objects in cluster. And, uh, there, there are specific uh, other uh, demons which do so uh, and the ones that uh, take care of it are called osds which are object store devices uh, which are responsible for storing objects on the local file systems or provide and providing uh, kind of access uh, to them over the network so typically uh, one osd demon is tied to one physical disk uh, in in the cluster and Ceph clients interact with OSDs directly. So they intelligently kind of peer to perform a replication and recovery tasks. Manager, MGR, uh, it provides additional monitoring and interfaces to external monitoring and management systems. So um, yeah, it is mostly used in monitoring uh, aspects. And MDS, it's the metadata server uh, daemon uh, for the Ceph distributed file system. So uh, now we know what Rook is dealing with. That is Ceph, uh, probably a good uh, point to stop and see if there are any questions. I don't, I don't see any. Um, do we want to talk about sort of the basic setup? How to get, how to get going? I have, uh, yeah. I have, I have one. I have one running. I can uh, I can demo quickly if people are are interested. Okay, uh, I I'll stop sharing and uh, maybe you can just go ahead and demo. Cool, cool. And we've seen a, a question saying, does does Ceph run as a pod? Do you want to? Yeah. So uh, Ceph runs as a set of pods. Uh, basically, the pods that I mentioned. Uh, are the ones which kind of contain uh, or kind of make up um, the self as a whole. So uh, it internally uses uh, an algorithm called crash, which is basically a, a crash. Uh, basically, it's a controlled replication under scalable hashing. So um, 
uh, it does automatic rebalancing and uh, kind of statistically uniform distribution of all the blocks. But eventually uh, what happens is that uh, the uh, demons that I uh, talked about are the ones that uh, run as pods. Yeah, and it handles the the whole Ceph, the whole Ceph setup. So on my screen, assuming you guys can see it, um, is a, a free tier deployment of, of Platform 9. Um, I've got a cluster that's deployed. It's called Rook3. Um, I deployed Rook quite a while ago into its its own namespace. And I use the the, the operator deployment to, to get this up and running. So a, a bunch of uh, kubectl commands. There's also a, a, a Helm chart that can be used to sort of simplify that a little bit as well. So what we're seeing here are all the deployments that are running. So we've got the monitoring deployments, the Ceph manager deployment, um, the operator, the CSI provisioner, um, and then I, I believe Ceph itself. If I go to the, the pods and just filter this to Rook again and find our Rook namespace, we'll see all the individual pods that are, are running and you can sort of see all the containers within them. So this is the, the CSI provisioner and you can see there's a whole bunch of CSI related um, elements. Because this has been run by the operator, I'm not having to, to really do much of anything. Um, to look at the, the cluster itself, it's gonna go over here to infrastructure and, and drill into it. This is a, a two node cluster. Um, and to get, to get storage running on this, because it's kind of handy to have, um, there's a few sort of prerequisites that, that are, a cluster requires or specifically the nodes to, to get this up and running. Um, so these two nodes are running on a on, on VMs. And when I built them on, I believe they're well, they're in Ubuntu 18, you can see it right there. I created the, the standard root disk for the operating system, everything to be installed onto. And then I added um, two 10 gig volumes that are just mounted. So if if I was attached to the, the operating system and run a, a DF minus H, you'll see where the operating system is running. And then you'll see a, another volume that's um, available to the node to be used. So you could format it within, within Linux and start consuming it. But that's from a storage perspective for Ceph and Rook, that's all you have to do is have at least one drive that's mounted and unformatted and Rook and Ceph will take care of all of that. If you are doing this on a small node, um, in our docs website, I've, we've got a, a set of instructions for Rook Ceph to go from start to finish. Um, it touches on the, the storage devices that are, are required, but to, to get up for a minimum installation, you just wanna make sure that you've got LVM2 installed. That is a, a prerequisite. You've got those attached but unformatted disks as well. And from that point, you're pretty good to go. Um, if you wanna use, the, the operator installation approach, this guide will take you through that using GitHub. Um, alternatively, you could, you could jump in using Helm. Um, what, this, what this guide does use, um, and it's important to, to understand here, I'm just gonna skip through it pretty quick because um, you can all follow, copy and paste, is Ceph is a, almost like a three-step process to get storage up and running. One is I've built my nodes, I've got unformatted volumes on, all the nodes I'm going to use as storage. I've installed the operator. That last step, or the second step, is is kind of the uh, the important step. Um, you're going to need to create a a Ceph cluster. So once you've installed Rook, you're going to tell it what to go and build, and that's what this step here is doing. And you'll see that I'm using cluster test. Um, all this can be found from the the GitHub repository. Um, so I'm just at the root level here. To find this, I've gone into cluster and I've gone into examples in Kubernetes. You'll see the three options here that we've talked about, right? We talked about Cassandra. We talked about NFS. We're, we're going to drill into Ceph. And here you're going to see a, a, a fairly extensive list. If you are getting started on just a small cluster, let's say one or two nodes, you're going to want to use this cluster test YAML. Um, this is important because it, there's a lot of, and I really don't like sharing Helm charts, 
but there's a lot of things that you can you can see can be turned on and off like am i running the dashboard crash collector and stuff like that but what this will do is it's going to use all nodes in the cluster to run that ceph cluster and it's really just going to simplify getting up and running um otherwise if you go into let's say one of the more complicated ones you can see cluster on you know cluster stretched or aws these are all the configurations that look at ceph explicitly and if you choose the wrong one um unfortunately ceph won't come up and rook's not going to be out of provision storage so that second step is a, a pretty big gotcha and once again if you're looking just to get up and running on a a small cluster definitely start with this cluster test one um it will simplify absolutely getting getting started from the, the start the reason for that is is it's going to use all nodes here use all nodes use all devices and that's that's really going to simplify getting up and running so i will post this in the the chat for everyone but this is the this is the bit of the learning curve that catches everyone i've built my nodes i built my cluster i installed rook ah i've got to run this ceph command which one do i choose if you're just doing development and, and, and wanting to learn definitely start here um, and that's everything I did to to get up and running um, on this cluster. And that last step that we'll touch on is really just creating the CSI driver. And once that storage class is built using the the Rookseph provisioner, um, if you turn it on as a default, you'll have storage available uh, within that cluster pretty much immediately. Um, I'm gonna click stop share, open chat because there is another question that's come in. Can a Ceph cluster make use of NFS or iSCSI storage made available on the cluster node, or does a block device need to be mounted locally on a K8 cluster node? That is a good question. Anup, have you played around with, with Ceph um, being configured to use different external storages? So I have just used uh, the volumes that we have. I haven't used NFS or iSCSI storage made available on cluster. But I think this is a good uh, question, and we we should definitely try it out. But yeah, I well, see no reason uh, to uh, for it not to work in such an environment. Yeah, it's it's definitely going to be one of these ones where you're going to be getting into the uh, the Ceph the Ceph cluster YAMLs that I was just sharing. Um, there are ones that are pretty extensive. I I personally uh, haven't tried this, but we can definitely send a follow up out um, to all all attendees on this question. Um, once we wrap. Yep. Cool. I think uh, there is another question, uh, Chris. Uh, does Ceph pod need privileged access on the node? It does. Yeah, it, it does. does. Um, if you're using uh, if you're using platform nine as well, we'll we'll turn that on. If you are just trying to learn, you're doing this on a single node or say two nodes. Um, I'd also say enable workloads on the on masters. I'd never recommend this for production, but that will really simplify getting Rook up and running as well. Cool, cool. Do you want to jump back into your, your presentation, Anup? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was talking about three layers. Um, and uh, so let us talk about those three layers uh, in Rook Ceph context. So think of Rook Ceph combination as a three layered architecture where Rook is real in orchestrator or an operator in Kubernetes that owns management of Ceph like deployments uh, and upgrades. And Ceph is kind of a complicated system to deploy. I have seen that. And Rook takes a lot of complexity away. Uh, out of Ceph deployment. The second layer uh, is the Ceph CSI driver. This will provision and mount the storage uh, in, into the app pod. So this is how Ceph storage is consumed. And the third layer is actually Ceph, which is the data layer. So reading and writing. So basically the IOs uh, uh, to the cluster uh, are purely done by uh, this layer. So no Rook management code is involved in this data. Um, 
So this picture is taken from one of the Rook TED Talks that is available uh, on the web. And it is showing that we have got a single uh, cluster which is running three nodes. Each of these black boxes uh, uh, is a node in the Kubernetes cluster. And each of those nodes uh, is running pods that uh, run different types of demons. So on the center node here, we have got a Rook operator pod and this is management layer that is going to manage everything else. This operator pod is going to deploy Ceph and CSI driver based on configuration um, that user defines. And these blue pods are really the core Rook pods that are providing management layer. The discovery pod, uh, which I had talked about earlier, uh, is discovering what storage is available on each node. So Rook knows how to deploy and deploy uh, the, uh, the Ceph, Ceph demons. Uh, the green pods are the CSI drivers. Uh, each node needs a CSI driver that will provision and mount the storage. And the red pods are the Ceph demons. There are many Ceph demons that provide data layer as mentioned earlier. Mm. They are backed by the local storage uh, on the node. So it is important that uh, they have local, local storage. Uh, and also like we had a question, we might also try that out regarding NFS. So uh, essentially Rook deploys all these pods and does management uh, at, uh, of uh, the Kubernetes uh, resource layer, creating uh, deployments, pods, services, et cetera. There's a, there's a question that's, that's come in an open. I think it's a pretty good, a pretty good one from uh, Yagesh. It says, can we support Rook Ceph cluster just to provide a distributed storage and consume the PVs generated within a separate Kubernetes cluster? Clusters can be in the same geographical location for latency is concerned. Is this something that would work? I think this is a, it's a pretty good yeah, question. Yeah. So uh, let's, I think there's a few ways to to architect a, an environment for providing storage to a Kubernetes cluster. If you've got multiple clusters and you want to use Ceph as a storage back end for all of those sort of versus buying a, an array, you would you would essentially be then having to set up those clusters to remotely consume from an external Kubernetes cluster. That's, have you looked at that ever and up? Sort of one cluster to another cluster, but you've got a, a dedicated Kubernetes storage cluster? Yeah, I do have a slide uh, which I'm showing right now. So this is a popular scenario uh, which uh, Rook uh, documentation claims. So uh, Rook can be deployed in a KTS cluster and can be connected to the external cluster. Uh, so once the connection is established, Rook will simply consume this external storage, getting details of the cluster and passing them to the um, CSI. So uh, the, the, this is called uh, external mode and uh, Rook does not manage the external cluster in the in this case, but it uh, simply helps consume the storage from the external cluster. Right. And probably also adds monitoring. Could, could you build a Ceph cluster using Kubernetes and then use external mode? That is something that I have not yet tried. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a pretty good question. I would also sort of throw out there, um, Yagesh, that you could create dedicated storage nodes in a cluster, and by using by using labels or taints, you could prevent other workloads from being scheduled onto those nodes. So then that cluster within itself would have a dedicated set of, of storage nodes that are technically workers, but then your other workers would be where you're scheduling um, your, your workloads as well. So that's, that is a way that you could, you could do this. Um, as an alternative, it just depends what you're trying to achieve. By the sounds of it, you, you're looking for multiple Kubernetes clusters consuming off one Ceph. Um, cluster in the back end. So I think that's another good item to uh, for us to follow up on is NFS as well as this uh, build a Kubernetes cluster for Ceph and then get other clusters to consume from it externally. 
Yeah. And what you talked about, uh, uh, Chris, uh, around tents and kind of node affinities, that is something which I have seen in the Ceph cluster CRD and uh, there are options to uh, kind of use all devices, use all nodes uh, based on the labels, uh, either taint or uh, select. So that is possible. Yeah, it gets, uh, it gets pretty complicated. The storage layer uh, with Rook and Ceph goes from simple to complicated instantly. Yep. Hopefully that uh, helps answer that question. Yeah. So uh, probably going back to uh, our second layer. Um, so this is CSI provisioning and this picture shows how an application can request storage from CSI driver. So if we start on the left, uh, the, this is an application that needs block storage, we can create uh, PVC using read write once. Um, that is the volume can be mounted as read write and uh, by, by a single node. So when this claim is created, that claim request goes to the storage class, which is FRBD in this case, and uh, which which is also set up by Rook, and then CSI driver will mount that uh, RBD storage into the application part. So that's on the left. Uh, something similar happens uh, for the shared file system as well. Uh, and there are two applications that need uh, to share the file system. So they both have their PVCs and uh, request goes to the storage class and CSI driver for the shared file system then mounts the storage. The third type on the right, uh, it's uh, for the object storage. Typically the application will need a bucket so it can read and write the objects to and from the bucket. So uh, a bucket claim instead of uh, PVC is generated in this case and uh, it requests the storage class uh, that is crafted for the object storage. So there is a bucket provisioner now in this case um, that is going to actually create a bucket instead of object storage and it provides that back to the application. Uh, Last layer, so now we have got our root layer uh, at one, layer one, uh, CSI driver at layer two. And essentially we need a, a layer from where the application needs to do I operations to the cluster. So the application has already got the volume mounted and there is self RBD driver, um, which is going to take care of writing to the self cluster. So it knows how to uh, how to connect to different uh, demons of uh, Ceph uh, to, the, to do the actual uh, IO operations. So same cases for file system uh, where it knows how to connect uh, to the MDS. MDS is the metadata server uh, inside uh, which manages the file system semantics. And pretty similar for um, the object storage as well where the S3 client um, uh, connects to the Redos gateway um, and then writes objects into the cluster. So uh, basically after this layer three, we know that uh, we have set up Rook, uh, use CSIs and uh, can write data to the cluster. And I think uh, this is something that uh, I had to cover with respect to technical stuff for ourselves. Should we pause and take questions now? Yeah, I think we should. Um... We've covered quite a lot of content. Um, we also touched on a little bit of the, the getting started. Um, a good question. Is there a specific disk requirement for Ceph to convert it to object storage? So, I mean, so did disks will always basically come down to what type of latency are you, are you looking for? Um, you know, if you're writing, if it's something that's got a high read rate, read write latency requirement, um, obviously SSD to NVMe would be the the preferred type of disk. If you're saying for object storage, um, it would then sort of come into how do you want to set up that object store on top of Ceph? Um, Anup, have you? Have you touched on object storage from Ceph? So uh, all the types of st storage basically kind of um, uh, 
uh, integrate into radars and if you look at uh, the uh, cluster um, yaml uh, i have just highlighted some stuff uh, and it basically supports hdds uh, ssds and vmes and uh, what not so uh, I, I, as you said uh, it, it's based on latency but uh, if you have uh, any of these uh, uh, kind of in your system it should work uh, of course i haven't tried everything uh, but uh, at least the crd is uh, supported yeah and it's ceph ceph gets quite quite deep um, so ceph itself does have you know support for object storage um, so you could use that natively. You could use something like Mini IO um, if you wanted to have a, a, a different application layer on on top of it. Um, but to me, disk disk requirements always come down to to latency. Um, if you are just looking to try it out, uh, Rook will require those those volumes if we're doing um, block to be at least five gig in size. Um, so if you are building VMs and sort of doing what I've done, doing a two node, two node cluster. Um, five gig is the, the minimum for it to, to operate correctly. Um, cool. I know a question, one of the things that I ran into, um, I spent hours and hours playing around with different clusters and different, um, Ceph cluster configurations. If you are sort of going into that, that trial and, you know, error, let's learn quickly and build and delete things. Um, if you are deleting your clusters and reusing the same nodes to recreate a new cluster, in between that cycle, you will need to go in and follow the Rook uh, documentation for uninstalling everything. Um, super easy to get up and running. Um, deleting everything isn't, isn't complicated. It's just not something that's automated like it is when you set it up. So that's definitely a gotcha that, that took me a while um, as I was building clusters on the same nodes and wondering why it was failing as well. Yeah, so they do have a specific documentation for tear down and unless and until you do that, uh, things don't work the next time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I spent a few hours scratching my head on that one. What does Ceph use for replication, DRBD, and is there ability to encrypt data when sending to remote end for replication. Are you talking with inner cluster or clustered, like two independent Ceph clusters or in between the disks that Ceph's managing? And So uh, from what I know, uh, it internally uses erasure coding. So uh, it definitely doesn't use replication just for HA purposes. So using erasure coding uh, and probably some algorithms uh, like parity declustering, it internally does the fault tolerance. So kind of network grade approach is what I know. Uh, with respect to uh, actual replication, uh, I'm not really sure how it is done. Yeah, Probably just that. copying copying the blocks, but not via DRBD. Uh, I don't think so. Or possibly, uh, I'm not really sure. Yeah, we'll definitely send out the follow up. So as I'm as I'm tracking, we've got Ceph using NFS mounts um, within the cluster. The replication um, and encryption. And then the third question was using a K8 cluster as a dedicated storage cluster and then using that as storage in another cluster. I think these are good, good items to, to follow up on um, as well. What's a typical data backup scenario for data stored in Ceph? Oh, that's a great question. Are we, there's sort of three layers here. If we're just looking for snapshotting, you could technically use the CSI driver snapshotting and, and snapshot the volumes. 
um, from Kubernetes and send that send that elsewhere. Um, if you're looking for sort of more application aware backup, you would then be moving something to something like a a Kasten um, for that's a, a a startup that Veeam acquired last year. That's a, a Kubernetes native backup. That's going to allow you to do more data from etcd as well as the the persistent volumes um if we're looking at ceph itself um i personally haven't looked at what could be done at the ceph layer um i would make the um the assumption that there is a a, a native ceph um snapshotting function just like there is for your NetApp filers of the world and other um, storage layers that are there as well. You would just have to be sending that off obviously to something that's that's external to to store that. And you could be duplicating a a lot of a lot of data there as well. Um, I will do a follow-up on that as well to to send some documentation out on snapshotting directly off of off of Rook. Um, so essentially, three three options that I see from a, from my experience in the backup world: use the CSI driver snapshotting for the volumes. Look at a tool, something like Kasten, for doing the entire cluster or that namespace along with the volumes. Um, PX backup is another example that could also help you do that. Um, it will do it to um, S3 storage as a external option, or you could get into the Ceph cluster itself and use its native snap snorting information as well. Yeah, and yeah, from what I know, it also uses um, clones, so which are writable snapshots for the file system. So that is something that can also be explored. Oh, cool. Yeah, if you're interested on, on Kasten, um, we've actually got a, a podcast that was hosted with, with one of the Veeam um, technical engineers and our CEO talking about, about Kubernetes and, and backup and all fun things. Um, Kasten's a, a pretty, a pretty good solution. Um, so PX backup as well. Cool. Um, do you have any other questions? I've got a little bit more time personally. Um, not sure about other hosts on the call. It does. It does. Uh, it does support incremental snapshots. Yeah. I think that out. is a basic requirement uh, for any snapshotting algorithms today. Yeah. Yeah. I'll throw in there. You probably want to at this point. You probably want a deduplication layer in the back end. Um, that's helping you save some some money on storage costs. I will do a shameless plug for my previous product that I used to product manage at Quest. It's called Core Store with a Q. It is a, a dedupe solution that will natively do Veeam. Um, it also has an S3 endpoint. So you could write to it and it will it'll dedupe. Um, it's a software defined secondary storage layer. So if you're going full x86 um, and just want to use generic storage, that's another good solution for your, your backup. It does replication between different core store setups. It also replicate to the cloud for archive and um, putting onto to cold storage as well. Just to sort of wrap out that last point of, of backup, depending how long you keep those for. Cool. I think this is a pretty good, good technical session. Um, thank you very much, Anup. I know it's late for you. Um, and that was a lot to to get through. If, yeah. if this is something that you uh, that people want to try out and you just want a cluster to play around with on, on VMs or AWS, Azure, um, do come check out our, our free platform. Um, as long as you have a cluster running, we'll keep you we'll keep you active. Should be super easy to get up and running. So check us out at platform9.com. If you have any other questions, uh, Slack is a great way or our community as well. And if there's no other questions, I say that's a wrap, guys. Thank you all for your time. And we'll see you in two weeks for another Kubernetes topic and Q&A sessions.
All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye.